Good afternoon, everyone. I'll try again. Good afternoon. That's great. It's the first, uh, this is welcome to CTL's first um, Global Leadership Speaker of the Year of 2015, um, U.S. Department of Transportation Secretary Anthony Fox. Um, before we have the interview with Professor Sheffy and Secretary Fox, I would like to introduce MIT President Raphael Reif, who will give a couple brief words and then introduce the speakers. Um, a faculty member since 1980, Professor Reif became the 17th President of MIT in June 2012. Prior to his appointment, he served as provost for seven years. And during his role as provost, as well as continuing on in his role as president, he's pushed through many initiatives to include the growth of MITx, our online learning initiative, along with edX. Also at MIT, while also at MIT, Dr. Reif served as director of MIT's Microsystems Technology Lab, as well as the department head of uh, electrical engineering and computer science. He's an inventor, co-inventor of five patents, or 15 patents, excuse me, edited, co-edited five books, and most impressively, in my opinion, supervised 38 doctoral theses. So please join me in, in welcoming Professor Reif. Thank you, Chris. And let me try what Chris did one more time just for my pleasure. So good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, that feels good. I'm pleased to welcome all of you here today for this very special event, and I'm pleased, very pleased to uh, welcome our guest of honor, United States Secretary of Transportation, Anthony Fox. In a few minutes, you'll be treated for what promises to be an illuminating conversation with the Secretary. But first, I want you to take a few moments to uh, note the remarkable impact that the Center for Transportation and Logistics has had over the past 40 years. Quietly, steadily, by using supply chain management to revolutionize essential industries and services, CTL has fundamentally changed the way much of the world works. Today, transportation and supply chain management principles are becoming increasingly central to some of the most pressing issues of our time, including energy, advanced manufacturing, and environmental and urban design. The timing of today's event could not be better. In the audience today, among you, we have a number of students participating in the MIT Global Supply Chain and Logistics Excellence Network, or what we refer to as SCALE. For those of you who might not be familiar with the network, SCALE is an international alliance of leading research and education centers created and led by the CTL. Central to SCALE's curriculum is an understanding of transportation and logistics systems. And so it's a deep honor for me to introduce today the leading figures of this event. Yossi Sheffi, a professor of engineering systems and director of CTL, will serve as the interviewer for these afternoon sessions. In other words, Yossi will be the MIT version of Charlie Rose this afternoon. <laughs> Is that, is that a challenge, Yossi? It's fine. <laughs> Yossi will guide a conversation with Secretary of Transportation, Anthony Fox, whom we are thrilled to welcome to our campus. As head of the Department of Transportation, Secretary Fox leads an agency that oversees air, maritime, and surface transportation. His primary goal is to ensure that the United States maintains the safest, most efficient transportation system in the world. He joined the department in July 2013 after the U.S. Senate confirmed his nomination with a vote of 100 to 0. That's a tremendous vote of confidence in our U.S. Secretary. Secretary Fox developed his appreciation for the fundamental role of transportation when he previously served as mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina. As mayor, he made efficient and innovative transportation investments, the centerpiece of his administration's efforts to create jobs and build economic recovery. In his current post, the secretary has taken a refreshing long-term approach to reforming our national transportation strategy. The secretary has identified what he referred to as a critical infrastructure deficit, a nationwide backlog of repairing and rebuilding. 
Under his leadership, the department is creating a 30-year plan to address that deficit, not simply by repairing a list of bridges or repaving certain highways, but by building dynamic integrated systems to serve the entire country's transportation needs. We're delighted that he has taken the time this afternoon to share his perspective on the state of transportation in the United States. Unfortunately, I myself have another commitment that I have to attend and be obliged to attend, so I regret I won't be able to, I won't be able to listen to his presentation. But luckily for me, it's being recorded, and I'll be able to watch it later and hear the Secretary's insights later today. With that, please join in welcoming Secretary Anthony Fox and Professor Yossi Sheffi. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wright. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, Secretary Fox. Good afternoon, Charlie. <laughs> well, I'll try to do no. <laughs> One of the uh, leading themes of, uh, of your administration is innovation in transportation, one of the things you've been uh, talking about. Could we start by talking a little bit about the role of innovation in shaping transportation? Which technologies do you think have the best potential to change the way or to improve the way people travel and goods are shipped? It's a great question. And uh, again, I want to thank the MIT community uh, and all of you for being here today. Uh, it's uh, an interesting time in transportation. Um, we're seeing disruptive technologies across the entire spectrum. And I think the challenge for transportation at the federal level is sorting out uh, uh, how to best integrate that technology into the marketplace, um, how to put uh, a stamp on it that continues to put a primacy on safety, uh, and frankly, how to ensure that uh, the uh, opportunities that technology presents are also integrated into our policy making thought processes as well. So for instance, uh, I think you're seeing some interesting technologies evolve when it comes to fuel use in automobiles. Um, those are already having a profound impact. And in fact, uh, one of my stump speeches is about the fact that our revenues are declining in the gas tax, part of which is caused by the incredibly uh, in efficient um, vehicles that are now on the road. It's a good problem, but it creates a structural funding problem for us when it comes to pay paying for our surface transportation system. Uh, we're also seeing uh, an awful lot of work in the autonomous uh, space. Uh, autonomous automobiles, I think, are uh, there's, there's still a ways away, but not that far away, and we need to begin uh, working to integrate the assistive and foundational technologies that will play a role in bringing that forward in the future. Uh, but we're also seeing that in aviation uh, with the next gen and the capabilities that next gen will be able to provide us over the long term. Uh, I see a future where we'll see uh, potentially automated uh, not only um, uh, single uh, passenger cars, but trucks and lots of things that will take on new dimensions going forward. That has uh, profound implications not only um, when it comes to how the operator actually engages a vehicle, but also think that there will be tremendous safety benefits and also fuel savings, particularly you think about trucks potentially being more automated and the opportunities to platoon those trucks and have them moving closer together creating fuel savings is a, is a big deal. So I think there's a lot of technology that's out there right now. Our challenge is to figure out how to integrate it as safely and as quickly as we can. Could we continue on these themes? The, the, the department started thinking or issuing guidelines on vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about this issue? Yes, um, we have seen uh, a dramatic rate of decline in uh, uh, fatalities associated with um, with automobiles over time. And frankly, um, part of our challenge as a department is, is the declines have happened so precipitously uh, that the ones that we are still left with on an annual basis are really becoming harder and harder for us to deal with. And um, most of them do relate back to behavioral patterns 
And some of those behavioral issues can be addressed with vehicle to vehicle technology. The idea, for instance, that a car will see an accident before it happens coming around the corner and will make a re and will a react in a way that uh, even the driver wouldn't have known to react to prevent that accident is a tremendous advance in safety and a potential uh, benefit not only in terms of saving lives, but also in terms of, uh, of moving us further along the way towards automated vehicles. So our rule, uh, we, we announced last spring that we were going to bring forth a rule that would provide the kind of foundation, the context, if you will, for the automotive industry to come in and actually deploy this in the marketplace. One of the challenges with technology in the, um, in the transportation space is that uh, sometimes the technology comes out and the automakers aren't so sure what requirements we're going to put on it. And this is our effort to actually uh, put the requirements out there in such a way that the industry knows what to expect so when they deploy it, they know that they can meet our guidelines and not have to adjust midstream once they've got it out in the marketplace. Who is responsible in the case of an accident? Is the, uh, the driver or the manufacturer? Well, uh, the liability <laughs> questions are certainly will be out there. Um, you know, I think in the short run, I can't imagine that, uh, that the, the, the liability will shift that greatly away from the driver. But you're raising a point that I think we see all the time and continue to grapple with ourselves, which is um, what is going to be requested or required of the driver as technology can take on more of the work. And uh, not just from a liability standpoint, but from the standpoint of just uh, how do you treat, teach driver's ed in a, in, a, in a world in which cars are doing more and more of the work. And that's, uh, that's a question that we have to ask ourselves we also have to rely on the states that do a lot of the educating of drivers and a lot of the uh, establishment of the liability uh, rules to also engage in those questions. Thank you. Let me uh, take on another theme sure. uh, that you mentioned. You mentioned the change in the energy picture, uh, more efficient cars, electric cars. Inflation, by the way, is you know, taking some of the uh, revenue, the, the, uh, uh, the effective revenue <coughs> that we can get from the, from the, from the tax. Mm -hmm. uh, how does it impact transportation planning? I mean, the revenue is going down, needs are going up, costs are going up. How, what's going to happen? Well, um, that's why I came to MIT to find and, out. <laughs> and <laughs> by, by 2.30 you'll get the answer. <laughs> uh, look, uh, I come from a municipal background. So I was on the front lines of this planning question. Absolutely. And I can tell you that what's happening is uh, whatever the infrastructure deficit is on paper, it's probably a multiple of that when you take into account the projects that are not being planned right now because of uncertainty about funding and other uh, aspects of our transportation system. And so, uh, for instance, we had, a, we had a transit plan. We are one of the fastest growing cities in the country. Uh, we had about a billion of it paid for and then about four billion of it that we didn't have. And a large chunk of that, about half of it, we were hoping the federal government would fund, but then when you have uh, sequestrations and shutdowns and highway cliffs, it starts to create a cloud of uncertainty that makes it very difficult to do the hard political lift of getting the public support to get those projects done. So I happen to think that our infrastructure deficit is bigger than what we say it is. And it's bigger because we're not planning the projects we should. Now, when we don't plan the projects, that means that at some point when we do plan the projects, the projects are going to have a cost factor that's going to be some multiple of what it is today. So we've got a big problem in this country. And I think that's one of the reasons why having a long-term highway bill is so important, because it would provide not only the short-term injection of resources to get projects done, but frankly, it would provide the confidence that these local and state leaders need to really get going on the planning process and move things along. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me change uh, uh, tax again. Yeah. The, uh, most of the students here are studying logistics, supply chain management, freight transportation. What we see with the uh, upcoming opening of the expanded Panama Canal sure. is that every port on the eastern seashore 
yeah. thinks that they're going to be the new LA Long Beach. Mm -hmm. They're dredging like crazy. They're, mm, you know, building tunnels. Miami is building a tunnel. They're, they seem to be, unlike other countries, there is no, because these are state investment and mm -hmm. they are, or, uh, or local, there's no overall strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's extremely unlikely that uh, all the ship will come to one, <laughs> one port or another, yet they're all investing. Yeah. How can we get out of this situation? Or well, what do we do? That's a, that's a really big challenge. Uh, I'm going to take some risks here and, and maybe get myself in some trouble uh, <laughs> trying to answer your question. But We can edit the tape later. <laughs> <on>. <laughs> uh, this raises, I think, one of the most important questions that we are confronting right now at DOT, which is that what got us here isn't going to be what gets us there. You know, in other words, the system that we have developed over many years has served this country incredibly well. But when you look at the political decision-making process, the way that it's cut into 50 different slices around the country, um, I would never suggest that you throw the whole thing out the door. But we do need to rethink how we are making investments and whether we're making investments as strategically as possible. So for instance, in our uh, Grow America Act, our surface bill, one approach we take is to use, uh, use a formulation that we used in the TIGER program, which was to say, instead of a, uh, an, uh, a rote allocation across all 50 states, we're going to pool a bit of money and we're going to have a kind of a race to the top conversation. So we want the best proposals from each state to come to us and we will fund the very best of the best. And I think when it comes to freight, uh, one, one concept that I think would be very useful is having a multimodal pot of money and saying, okay, let's see the very best ideas emerge. And we want to encourage not only one state to figure out what it wants to do, but we're going to encourage states to actually join together and to get scale out of the investments that we're, we're making. And we're also going to not uh, predetermine whether they're surface or, or port uh, investments or rail investments. Uh, we're going to look for the ones that are going to make the biggest impact on our ability to grow jobs. Um, and I think that's an approach that needs to be taken. Um, in addition to that, Congress asked us in MAP21 to develop a national uh, freight plan. And so we've pulled together almost 50 people from all around the country who look at these issues. And uh, that process is ongoing, but I expect that very soon we will have uh, a national freight plan. The problem with the national freight plan is that the national freight plan has no national freight money. And so, um, uh, once again, we find ourselves in this pickle of not being able to resource the great ideas we have. So I think s joining those two ideas together, having a national freight plan that identifies projects, then having a competitive way to get those projects funded, I think those two things working together could help us a great deal and it would actually help us address some of the strategic questions that you're raising. Another strategic question, which probably have, have the same answer, is that over the next few years, we can expect as more manufacturing moves into the United States, into uh, Mexico, that a, a lot of the freight flow, which used to go west to east, yes. would start going north to south or internal mm -hmm. to the United States, which means that our transportation system is now the freight transportation system. Yep. If you look at the railroad map, mm -hmm. it's set west to east. Yes. It, it's not set north south, it's yes. not set to, and it, it's a system. It needs yes. everybody to participate. Yes. Again, another challenge, uh, and it has to be addressed squarely. And uh, uh, I think you're also seeing us uh, working more closely with our counterparts in Canada and in Mexico to ensure that the plans that we have on the books for the U.S. also make sense from a North American perspective so that we can uh, do the very best job we can of scaling uh, the efforts across countries. But uh, I didn't want to leave out the point you made about the post-Panamax vessels, which was uh, the competition we're going to have for uh, the East Coast uh, ports isn't just going to be among East Coast ports. The Carib Caribbean is also a, a, a strong competitor for us there. And so Absolutely. getting our act together is going to be really critical going forward. And again, uh, I think we need more tools to help us do that. And those are proposed in some of the legislation we've put forth. The Panamanian thing that the strongest, the strongest competitor will, will, will be Cuba, actually, yeah. uh, with, which can become a very strong competitor. Before I turn to the uh, audience to ask questions, 
Let me ask you a, maybe a more personal question. Anything in your experience as a mayor help you in your current job? <laughs> or how did you take any of the, your experience as a mayor to your current job? Well, a couple of things. Um, I think that just as a category, mayors are the last group of leaders that are really considered to be hugely practical. You know, uh, when I was <laughs> a mayor uh, in local government, uh, you didn't have a Republican or a Democratic pothole. You know, it's a, you know, it's a long, uh, it's an often stated phrase, but it's actually true. You have to deal with everything and everyone. And um, so I think having a very practical perspective has been useful. Um, I also think that it's also brought me to Washington with a fair amount of skepticism about how national policy flows down to local government. And, um, you know, I, I, I uh, quiz my team all the time about the, even the proposals we're making because I, do, I don't want them just to be science experiments. I want them to be things that practically are going to change things for the better on the ground and make life easier. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, for those of you uh, transportation policy nerds, uh, there's something called uh, Metropolitan Planning Organizations. Oh, sure, MPOs. And uh, they are like the Neighborhood Association of Transportation. They're the, <laughs> the group that uh, comes up with ideas and they forward them over to the states and try to get their projects on the state transportation improvement plans, ultimately hoping to get funded. Well, I grew up in a community that had uh, an economic sphere of influence of 17 counties, even one going into the state of South Carolina and an MPO that comprised only two of those counties. And as I've started to see more consolidation of uh, economic regions in this country, mega regions, if you will, I've begun asking myself the question of whether we as a transportation community have organized these MPOs in as effective way as possible from a planning standpoint to maximize job growth and economic potential. So our proposal actually contains a uh, a, a pot of money that would incentivize communities to consolidate their MPOs along economic regions of interest, thinking that the local communities will come together, work together towards common goals that will help them build transportation projects that will create jobs. It's a simple idea, but uh, uh, I think we are some, in some ways underutilizing some of the planning tools we have in the system and not making those systems uh, talk to each other in a way that's going to be useful to the economy. Thank you. Let me open it now for uh, questions. We have microphones on the right, and on, at least on my right it's and my left. If you have a question, please raise your hand and walk to the microphone. The first brave soul. Um, so. Thanks for your comments. Sure. And I, I actually wanted to go back to the autonomous vehicles sure. question. Um, and so if we assume that uh, autonomous vehicles are successful and driving becomes safer, more convenient, more pleasant, there's also kind of a concern embedded in that that more people will be willing to commute to work rather than take public transit, more people will drive longer distances. And over the long term, this could have huge impacts in terms of land use and employment patterns. And I guess I'm just wondering, is there anything at the federal level that's really looking into like, not just the safety concerns about autonomous vehicles, but making sure that the system that they evolve into doesn't have terrible you know, negative consequences, <clears throat> especially over the long term. So, very good question. Um, our department is uh, a department that has to concern itself with, with, with two things. You know, safety is the overarching goal of everything we do. But one thing is, however people move, whatever choices they make about which mode to use, we want to make sure that we are pushing the line on safety as much as we can. So making it as safe as possible to move within that context. So in some ways, we take a, a neutral position on these issues, on these questions. Um, on the other hand, back, going back to Secretary Volpe, Secretary Coleman, uh, Secretary Skinner, there have been a series of previous secretaries who have done uh, some of the work to occasionally prompt the country, Congress, stakeholders, those who study and research these issues, 
to look at where we are and to frame the questions that need to be addressed over a longer range of time. And that's what our 30-year plan uh, or framework is really about, is about uh, not necessarily being prescriptive, but starting to lay out some of the choices. So to your question, um, you know, one major question this country is going to face is on transit investments and uh, how much uh, transit investment uh, is enough for a country that's growing by 100 million people, where you're starting to see uh, fraying in some of our legacy systems, particularly in the Northeast and the Midwest, and huge population surges in places like the Southeast and the Western parts of the country that are more and more or less auto-dependent but could, if they were uh, incentivized, uh, integrate more transit into their systems. And so uh, I think this is ultimately a policy question, but it's one that needs to be framed in the right way, and our 30-year framework is going to try to put that question out there in a very real way to this country. All right. I'd say the same thing for rail, by the way. I think heavy rail is also a part of passenger rail is a part of that, too. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about what you what do you see as the future of alternative fuels, such as things like um, you know hydrogen fuel cells and natural gas, and what's the you know what's the policy on that? Is the federal government involved in trying to push for one or the other, or yeah. you know make infrastructure investments in these in these kinds of things? So I'll answer your question, but I will warn you that uh, I ended up buying a beta VCR back in the day. Uh, <laughs> So I'm not always good at picking the right, uh, <laughs> the right technology. Um, but, um, you know, look, I think there are going to be a lot of different <coughs> technologies that are going to incubate for a while. Um, electric vehicles are kind of the hot thing right now, but you are starting to see other technologies start to come into the marketplace. And I think it's too early to tell which are, which are going to be the ones that dominate. Obviously, as we start to see an energy resurgence in this country, uh, prompted a, a lot by the prevalence of natural gas, um, that provides an opportunity for us. But I think it's too early to really see where that's going. I think we have to um, play this out a little longer. So uh, I'm excited to see some, uh, some new fuel choices be in the marketplace for consumers. Um, but I think, you know, it may, may not be a situation where there's one dominant one uh, or one may emerge out of the group that's in there now. We'll see. Thank you very much. Yep. Let's have one, sure. one question there. Thank you so much. <clears throat> well, one of the um, main news that's been uh, released recently regarding the transportation system in the U.S is the future construction of the uh, high-speed rail between um, San Francisco and, and Los Angeles in California in the, in the West Coast. And um, what's your strategy, strategic view uh, regarding the um, high-speed rail transportation system, in particular uh, related to the East Coast um, metropolitan areas and the interconnection? And as you were previously uh, talking about this, uh, the high huge influence of the uh, metropolitan areas in the economic network, uh, both for freight transportation and for person transportation? Yeah, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, tomorrow out in California, Governor Brown will, uh, will formally break ground on the high-speed rail project that you just talked about, the San Francisco to uh, Los Angeles connection. It's a big deal for the country. Uh, I'm bullish on high-speed rail. Um, and I'm bullish because I know what kind of growth is coming uh, in this country. And uh, unfortunately, from a policymaking perspective, we have a tendency to focus on now and the last 25 years. And we really need to be thinking about now and the next 25 or 30 years. And so I think high-speed rail is all about the future. And it's about giving folks real choices uh, to, to go a different way, not having to get on an airplane necessarily, uh, or take a car for a long trip. Uh, what you're going to see, I suspect, is um, the emergence of uh, more conversation on public-private partnerships on high-speed rail that are connecting city pairs. Um, in other words, I don't think you're going to see a huge end-to-end -end kind of transcontinental railroad kind of effort on high-speed rail. I think what you're going to see are 
city pairs linking up over time and eventually those city pairs will connect uh, the country in a, in a much more significant way. Um, and so the challenge right now is to try to get these things off the ground. So California is huge because it's the tip of the spear. But look at Texas. Texas may surprise you. Look at Florida. Florida may surprise you. Um, it would surprise us. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, so these things, uh, these things have, a, have, a, have a way of, of working themselves out. And I'm very, uh, very bullish on it. Um, one question, several questions will emerge here. And one of them is whether the technologies will connect. You know, it's entirely conceivable because you have different city pairs that are emerging that uh, some of them will use a technology that doesn't necessarily fully integrate with a different city pair. And that may limit our ability to connect. And that's where, um, you know, potentially there's a federal role to try to help make sure that doesn't happen. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was the question there. Yes, I, I think you, you gave me the intro for my question. You said we ought to be thinking 25 years in the future. I, I will contend we probably need to be thinking 50 to 100 years in the future. And mm -hmm. here is my reasoning. If I draw an analogy to the transportation infrastructure in the US, that's one of the best in the world, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's probably one of the biggest in yeah. the world, the biggest from the point of view of investment. And every time you do capital investment, the biggest issue that you have is amortization. How is it going to hit you? Because you, need, you know you are going to need to replace it. Like we are talking about new potential new technologies uh, for self-driven cars. And you can conceive self-driven cars with a different infrastructure, a basic infrastructure, to be a lot smarter than with the current infrastructure. Yeah. So the, is there any, my question now, is there any commission, permanent commission, or at least a consideration to create one that's going to be doing this thinking? Yeah. It's a good question. Uh, so, um, commission, you know, within I each of our modes, there are uh, groups that we bring in from the outside, uh, uh, stakeholders, if you will, that are charged with helping us think long term. Uh, I know that, for, exa for example, in aviation, we have a Next Gen Advisory Committee that is charged with focusing squarely on helping us think through that particular project. They've been together uh, for a while. Memberships changed from time to time, but it's been a long-standing group. And there are other ones like that within DOT. We also I want to give a shout out to the Volpe Center folks who are here today, uh, because uh, many years ago, uh, there was a decision made to create a research arm of DOT. And Volpe is one of the uh, leading institutions in the world at transportation research. Uh, and does draw on a lot of outside input in doing its work. Um, you know, I have to be uh, candid with you. I think, I think some of the, the challenges our system has over a 100-year you know, period uh, aren't because we don't have good thoughts that are coming out of places like MIT and other places. It's frankly that I think um, our Congress is challenged to think that long. Um, you know, we're lucky if they think beyond two years at a time. Uh, and, and doing a 30-year plan is ambitious from the standpoint that there will be people who question whether we can see clearly that far out. Um, but I think that uh, uh, we, uh, I'll take your idea back and see what we can come up with, but I, I think that the reality is that um, in our system, in our democ democratic system, the decisions about policy Rest, it, rest in Congress. And we've got to do our very best job of making sure the folks that get elected to Congress understand the, the, the pure weight of the decisions they make. For instance, you know, when you have a highway cliff approaching, um, just having it approaching without having a long-term answer to the question has profound implications in terms of how this, the infrastructure is able to build and regenerate. And uh, I know there are a lot of folks up there on a bipartisan basis who are really trying to inject reason and rationality into the system, but it is very difficult. And that, I would say, is one of the biggest inherent barriers to a longer outlook. I have something of a follow-up question. <clears throat> Excuse me, a follow-up question to your comments from before. Um, 
you were talking about connecting city paths. Yeah. Um, it seems like with some of those city paths, some of the suggestions of city paths that have happened already, they haven't really succeeded. They were kind of started with a, if we build it, they will come mentality, and people didn't necessarily come. Say, for instance, the connection between Norfolk, Virginia, and Virginia Beach, Virginia, which never, it still hasn't been finished yet, and it's sat out for an extended period of time. Studies on connections between Cincinnati and Columbus that never turned into anything, or even the studies about Interstate 81 and having high-speed rail there, <coughs> excuse me, to uh, limit the number of vehicles on the road. Those, considering those, I won't say failures, maybe delays, um, the arguments for some people um, who would be against having high-speed rail, they can use those as examples of why this isn't going to work. How exactly are we going to get people past that when we want to look out 20, 25, or 100 years later when you can literally say that we don't know that the, there's going to be a customer base for these things and look at this history. This says that there won't be. Why should we put all of this money into these, um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, why should we put all this money into this investment? It's a great question. Um, I think that what we're missing in this country is a clear example of what high-speed rail can do. And that's why California is so important, because if it's as successful as we believe it will be, it will then provide what I think will be the catalyst, the political ca uh, catalyst, for more support to see it happen in other parts of the country. Um, just as a barometer of, of just the idea of high-speed rail and how I think it is actually uh, taking root in this country uh, among the political class is, you know, the fact that uh, uh, California has had this project that's been out there since the Recovery Act that we've put substantial resources into. Uh, it's finally breaking ground. But just think about, you know, Texas. Texas. Uh, the state of Rick Perry is looking at a, seriously looking at a connection between Dallas and Houston, a uh, high-speed connection. Florida, uh, the state that rejected high-speed rail funding, is now looking at a connection between Miami and Orlando. And so I say it to you not to make a political point other than to say that I think, I think you know, leaders of the states around the country are now starting to see that their mobility choices are gonna be limited if they can't add rail into the equation. And many of them are starting to look at, at high-speed rail to do it. Now, I'll also say the Recovery Act was successful on another front, which was um, it was successful in getting higher speed rail around the country. Uh, for instance, uh, having been from Charlotte, I know that the connection between uh, Charlotte and uh, uh, Raleigh has, uh, has gotten uh, or is getting faster as a result of, uh, of investments that are made there in uh, Chicago and uh, Detroit is going to also get a little, little faster, but those are not going to be 200 mile an hour trains. Those are going to be like 110 here and there, um, but we're still increasing speed there. But I think California getting underway, getting done, is going to be critical to the future of high speed rail in the country. Thank you. Hi. I've heard that you have a lot of issues here inside the country, but what about uh, the NAFTA countries, Canada, Mexico, and the U.S.? Um, how can these three countries can improve the, the mobility of people and goods? Because, well, I'm Mexican and our perspective, well, our, our point of view, it's um, our country has, mm, has very limited infrastructure. Well, and now it's gone, going a lot of investment. But um, what uh, the U.S. government is expecting from Mexico and how can the three countries can work together? Yeah, well, it's a great question, and uh, tomorrow we'll mark uh, yet another uh, foundational movement towards uh, more open barriers between the U.S. and, and Mexico with the, uh, the next round of high-level economic dialogues. The vice president will be leading that. I'll be participating in that as well. Uh, we have a number of opportunities uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as a continent to create more fluidity between uh, our, our borders, and um, uh, whether it's commerce or what have you, I think that you're going to continue to see the administration um, working hard to ensure that we're doing the best job we can of creating a better future, not only for U.S., but also for the entire continent. Um, uh, one issue that we are um, 
uh, that we're one holdover from NAFTA that we're still uh, working through uh, is the, uh, the cross-border trucking uh, program. And uh, uh, I'm not at liberty to make any announcements today, but I can tell you that uh, a lot of work is still going into uh, getting that in a good place and, and uh, hopefully soon. So I, I think you're going to continue to see developments in terms of creating more uh, open access on, on both sides of the, uh, of the uh, country. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sir, early on in the interview you had mentioned that as more efficient, uh, fuel efficient vehicles come into usage or more efficient modes of transportation come into usage, the taxes associated with the gas that provide the funding for Department of Transportation will go down or are already going down. So what kind of alternate taxation models or revenue policies are under consideration at the department? Or are there alternate business models that would probably forego the tax altogether and involve, let's say, a private partnership at a bigger scale than it is currently? Yeah. So. Um, I think there are at least, I'm going to stipulate four things that I think we should be doing in the short term and then talk about the longer term. Um, we clearly need a long-term highway bill on the surface side. Uh, and politically, I have no indications that there's going to be an openness to raising the gas tax to do that. Um, even in I'm just guessing. Yeah. Even in Massachusetts, it didn't go <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. There's yeah, an indication. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so we've proposed a, uh, a way of dealing with this using one-time revenues from corporate tax reform, business tax reform, um, to uh, dramatically increase the amount of investment that's made in the, the surface system. To do it without raising taxes, without raising rates, um, which I think meets the principal test of, of our uh, Republican uh, colleagues on, in, in ca on Capitol Hill. Um, but we need to do something just to get the system back in regular order. And I think our approach would do that and not only get the highway trust fund stabilized, but actually put dramatically more money into our surface system. So that's number one. Number two, um, we need to look at ways that we can streamline the system to reduce cost. Uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, that I experienced as a mayor was uh, uh, the years and years and years it would take you to get the permitting work done. And we have experience at DOT with getting that work done within a much shorter period of time, which ultimately saves a lot of money. Like the Tappan Zee Bridge in New York, $5 billion project, public-private partnership was put on our dashboard and we worked through what was probably four or five years of permitting in the space of 15 months. And we did that sitting arm in arm with EPA, Department of Interior, all of the different equity holders on the environmental side, looking at the permits at the same time and it saved us an awful lot of time and saved the project money. So can we operationalize a review process like that? That's one of the questions that we're asking ourselves. Third, public-private partnerships are going to be part of the mix of how we get things done in the future. And so we're looking at our programs, TIFIA, RIF, um, private activity bonds, everything that we do as a department that touches on public-private partnerships. We're trying to figure out how we can get better at, um, at making the public sector aware of the programs that are available. Because right now you pick up the phone and call us about TIFIA you're going to get a conversation about TIFIA. No one's going to talk to you about RIF, private activity bonds, or anything else. So we kind of leave it to the jurisdictions to tell us what they want. But we probably need to be in a position of kind of telling them how they can get there using multiple ways that we, we currently have. So we have a, uh, an effort the president has asked us to lead called the uh, Build America Transportation Investment Center. It's basically a 3P operation that's going to be looking at trying to expand the use of 3Ps across the country. The last thing is, um, over the long term, I think um, we're going to have to look at a different structure. And that structure could be a structure like some states have taken on where they, they tax the oil barrel uh, and get away from taxing the pump. Uh, it could be looking at uh, things like VMT, um, which uh, is now being 
studied by Oregon. Uh, I think that's a longer range conversation. I think right now uh, we gotta, we've got to focus hard on getting the system reset back on a pace to have a, a four, six year bill, something that's going to get us over the long term and then continue to have those questions uh, be, be addressed by Congress. Thank you. We have another question over there. Hi, uh, Secretary Fox. Uh, yeah. This is Christian Bautista. I am a Mexican citizen, and I have a similar question about sure. the border. So if not to improve uh, the, or to in, if implement the borderless strategy, so you need to improve safety. And my question here is going to be, with the current infrastructure you have in the border points with Mexico, how much extra investment you have to do I mean, in order to reach that safety level that the, the U.S. wants? Uh, it's a tough question. And, uh, you know, it depends on uh, a lot of factors, including the different modes you're talking about. Um, uh, you know, the, the standards set by NHTSA on autos versus the standards set by uh, uh, FMCSA on trucking versus, you know, whatever. I, I, I think we've made a lot of progress over many decades. and. Uh, in uh, signaling to our North American uh, neighbors what standards we set for our vehicles. And that's why uh, it's, um, it's been easy for some of the manufacturers to produce things there because they're building to the standards that we set. So I don't know that it's going to be, you know, perhaps as, as huge a, a, a thing as, as maybe one might think. I do think there's an awful lot of conversation happening between us and Mexico on uh, things like uh, integrating uh, technology into their infrastructure. For instance, the, uh, the whole Easy Pass phenomenon is one that they're very eager to learn more about because they see opportunities to build up their, their highway and road systems and, uh, frankly, uh, to look at different ways to address the border issues. Uh, using technology, and so I think there's a very, very robust conversation going on on uh, how we can uh, work together to create technologies that both countries can make good, good use of. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hello, sir. Yeah. So uh, my question is regarding uh, U.S. oil imports and maritime policies, which it has. So it's a series of questions. So first question is, uh, U.S. oil imports, we all know it's uh, decreasing. Uh, so the number of super tankers hitting your, um, uh, co uh, I mean, coast, uh, especially in the Galveston and the Loop area, will be reducing. So uh, their revenues uh, coming from that will also reduce. So is there any policy coming up for in, uh, providing some kind of incentives to ports which are totally dependent on uh, U.S. oil imports, especially like uh, uh, Loop and uh, Galveston? Uh, you know, it's a, another good, good question, uh, one that uh, probably goes as much to uh, my colleagues at uh, the U.S. Trade Representative, uh, the National Security uh, Council, uh, and um, the Department of State as to me. Uh, this is what I think we're going to see in the, in, the, in the near term. I think you're going to see with inland ports you're going to start to see uh, uh, more use of natural gas uh, in the shipping industry, which will be incredibly uh, impactful to them just in terms of moving things within the borders of the country through inland waterways. Uh, I think you may see um, more export activity when it comes to that same natural gas product. So it may be that the uh, import activity is replaced by export activity uh, to some extent going down into those, those channels. We'll see how it plays out, but I, I don't have a particular um, uh, strategy around that area, but I can certainly reach back to you with, uh, with folks who've done more, more thinking specifically about those parts of the country. Okay. Uh, so uh, just in case, like, uh, uh, it, if it is supposed to be going down, the, the, there are ports which are deep, deep water ports. Mm -hmm. And uh, as someone has asked about amortization of the investments. So uh, these ports uh, have already invested a lot. Uh, again, my question is about the incentives. The, I, I agree that there will be uh, exports increasing, but there will be a time lag 
uh, in exports building and it will not be in the oil sector it will be in the gas sector only so the terminals for oil and gas are two separate things and they are uh, owned by two separate entities how are uh, how is uh, government planning on uh, those yeah. deep water ports and also uh, there's a, a shipping lane from gola that is galveston oil platform uh, going up to bahamas that is only occupied by uh, uh, super tankers so in just in case the imports uh, i mean the imports are reduced these uh, specialized shipping lanes will be of no use so what are the plans uh, i mean is it going to be open for uh, other uh, commodities or mm -hmm. will it be uh, means restricted to uh, oil only yeah so the real answer here is that you one has to look at who runs the ports uh, and uh, that is by and large not us. Um, the ports are run primarily in some cases by private uh, entities, in some cases by uh, state authorities and so forth. And uh, a lot of the, uh, the uh, planning work, uh, figuring out what's going up, what's going down, how to react to different shifts in the marketplace are happening at the state uh, and local levels in, in many cases. Um, when you talk about incentives, um, you know, our, to be honest with you, one of the biggest drives of our department is to do as much as we can to ensure that we still have an active maritime uh, um, uh, uh, country. Uh, and uh, that's both because it's important from a commerce standpoint, but also it's because it's important from a national defense standpoint. Um, and so our activities are really focused around there. A lot of safety activity, but in terms of trying to drive that conversation, it's really focused more at the state and local levels. Let me turn to yeah. maybe a question before last. Oh, excellent, thank you. Um, Joshua Zagorzewski, I'm with the Federal Highway Administration Division Office here in Massachusetts. Great, and thanks I, for your work. Uh, thank you. Um, really appreciate uh, the comments you've made today on how all of our separate modes have been working to maximize the efficiency of our indiv individual networks between next gen, uh, trying to improve you know, for FAA and everything going on at our ports. Uh, I think one of the strongest successes that we've seen on trying to bring an intermodal approach to transportation has been through TIGER mm -hmm. and uh, what's proposed under the Grow America. And I look forward to seeing more of that innovation to tie our freight and our transit and basically modal choice um, so that we can plan accordingly yeah. and, and work accordingly and see how the growth returns. Because uh, I don't think we're seeing a lot end of our return on investment, um, especially to those elected in Congress who continue to move us forward with policy. Uh, so hopefully the message today is that we need to look at our successes, plan for the future, and uh, embrace the innovations. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks oh. for the question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question. We'll, no. have, we'll have one more question, given the statement. Yeah, sure. No, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Thank you. Oh, so uh, my question is focused on innovation. And uh, over the last couple of years, we have seen innovation, which was more unconventional. Yeah. Uh, not on assets or infrastructure, but more on delivery of services, uh, like mobile applications that enable uh, mm -hmm. uh, people to share cars, share rides, and so on. What is the uh, role of the government uh, in terms of policy, uh, in terms of oversight and regulation for these new upcoming technologies? So, in a, in a um, not that I'm surprised, but you all have asked some very fascinating questions. This is one that I think is, uh, is really a uh, uh, cutting edge question because, you know, heretofore, we've left, let's just take uh, services like Uber, just as an example. Um, that's basically fallen to state government and in some cases local government. And, um, it's been fine for it to be there when the idea was they were certifying taxi companies and so forth. 
I'm not saying that we're changing positions on it, uh, but what I am saying is that with the emergence of these, these new players in the marketplace that are doing things in a way that was never even imagined even five years ago, um, it does create, raise interesting questions about uh, whether there could be a standard set. Um, I'm not saying that, that we would necessarily uh, propose that. I'm just um, uh, pointing out that I think that uh, what you're seeing, when, whether it's safety, whether it's the standard of the vehicle, whether it's the background of the driver, whatever it is, um, you know, some of these things are falling into gaps in state and local policy, and the question is, who's going to pick up those pieces? Um, and that's something we're looking, uh, looking at without having a predetermined answer. Unfortunately, yeah. we have Mr. Secretary, unless you want to, yeah, to address did, you know, this, this last point. The, so just imagine this is, tells you how, how connected these modes are. Let's say we figure out how to get the ports strategically positioned for these post-Panamax vessels. Well, the stuff that comes in and out of those ports has to get, get there somehow. To and out. Yeah. And so you have uh, the need to double stack the containers, and you have a lot of rail tracks that have uh, bridges that are too short to take on those double tracks. So the surface system connects to the port system and connects to the rail system and connects to the aviation system. All these things have to work together. And I think if I could leave you with one, one overarching thought is that with this 30-year framework we're putting out there, part of what we think needs to happen as a reset in this country is we've got to stop thinking about aviation as aviation and federal rail railroads as railroads and highways as highways and bikes as bikes. All these things are part of a system that we as users want to use seamlessly. And if we don't think about it that way on the front end, it's not going to work out that way on the back end. That's Finally, the Mr. Secretary, the price of oil just went below yes. 50 per barrel. How low would it go? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> and take this, uh, take this for what you, what you, what you paid for it. But uh, I, you know, I, I, I have no idea. I think, uh, <laughs> Welcome uh, to the club. Exactly. It's, it's fascinating to think about, though, it's absolutely with all the implications. Amazing. But uh, I have a lot of friends and family I saw over the last couple of days, and uh, they're, not, they're not upset about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You. Secretary. Okay. Appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Sam. Wonderful. Great job. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you.